My name's Emma. I am the head of development at a company called Microgen. Um, I started life as a Java developer, but these days I lead teams who are going through cultural transformation and digital transformation, helping them to discover their own level of awesome. Okay? My talk was inspired by a really, really stressful weekend a couple of years ago. Um, when I walked into the office after a bank holiday weekend where I'd been on call, uh, I was tired, I was really, really grumpy, and I had managed to work my way through a P1 incident. Okay? As I walked in through the office, the very first thing that somebody said to me was, hey, who broke prod? And I swear that by lunchtime, seven other people on my team had asked me who had broken prod. So the weekend had been particularly stressful because it was also my daughter's birthday. Okay? It takes a really, really special sort of parenting superpower to work a P1 incident while you're also in a bowling alley with 16 five-year-olds. Okay? <laughs> so that contributed to the grumpiness. But all the way through that, it had never once crossed my mind to ask who had broken prod. I was really, really focused on solving the problem, not on trying to find the source of blame. Okay? So that's why I'm here today. Because that day, when everybody asked me who broke prod, I resolved to try and tackle that culture of blame. And I resolved to try and help us collaborate more together to go and solve the problems rather than accusing people. Okay? Let's get to the facts. Bad stuff happens. It doesn't matter what amazing resilience architecture you've built. It doesn't matter if you've employed the most talented cloud architect on the planet. It doesn't matter if you go and, put and change management process, or all these release stage gates. It really doesn't matter, because ultimately, failure is inevitable. And the sooner that we come to terms with that, the sooner we can start focusing on preparing ourselves for failure rather than trying to prevent it. Okay? So lots of the reading that you do around DevOps kind of points to failure being production outages. Now, I've been through production outages. They hurt. But as a dev manager, most of the painful, the really, really personal failures that I've been through have been on dev teams sort of slightly away from that production boundary. And it isn't any less painful if you're not dealing with an outage. So perhaps you've had a sprint which was a complete disaster and you haven't achieved anything. That's painful failure too. Or perhaps somebody's reported a defect in your system. Yeah, so currently I'm working on an on-premise system, and when someone reports a defect, okay, it's not a production outage for us, but it still hurts. And the other thing to bear in mind about preparing yourself for failure and this inevitability is that um, when we talk about DevOps, there's lots of learnings around Lean and Kanban, and they're all based on manufacturing. And in manufacturing, you tend to find that you've got really stable systems, and they're quite predictable. But the sorts of systems that we all deal with, they're not stable and they're not predictable. And every time that anything changes in our system, we're at risk of failure. And every time that any data changes in our system, we're at risk of failure. So stop trying to prevent it and go embrace that failure. So my talk today is centered around some themes of ways that we can prepare ourselves for failure and ways that we can slowly chip away at that blame culture. And each of my themes, I'll talk to you a little bit about, and then I'm going to share with you some tips on things that you can all do in your own companies or in your own time to help you prepare for failure. So some of the slides you'll find, there's lots and lots of text. I don't expect you to read it all now. Take pictures, watch them on YouTube, but you can use them as a reference. So my first theme is about the human response to failure. Why does it feel so painful when the system you've been busting a gut to build goes down. Why is that? Why does it see, feel so uncomfortable? And the reason is because we're humans. It's been built into us for many, 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 many thousands of years. Okay? When your system that you've been working on, either you've built it or you support it, maybe you dreamt it up. Okay? When it fails, it's a form of feedback. It's negative feedback. And most humans aren't well equipped for responding to negative feedback. I'll give you an example. So last year, I was offered the services of a career coach. And this career coach 
said to me, after performing all sorts of analysis and tests and stuff, he said to me that he thought I was somebody that was not very resilient. <sighs> okay. My reaction to that, sat in a room with this career coach, was to burst into tears. Uh, so demonstrating exactly the feedback that he was giving me. So my response to negative feedback was to burst into tears. And if you ask my current boss how I respond to setbacks at work, he'll tell you that I tend to get angry, I get defensive, and I do burst into tears at least once a month. Okay? So we need to teach ourselves as humans to respond a bit more positively to feedback. And that has to be a conscious decision. Okay? You have to practice it. It's hard. The other really weird human reaction to failure is to go and seek blame. I'm not sure that I can explain it other than it's a defense mechanism. So when something breaks or when your system just goes boom, there's this human reaction which is to curl up into your armadillo ball and put up all your emotional defenses. And that's us deflecting blame. It's us trying to um, protect ourselves from any punishment that might be associated with it. And as we put up our emotional defences, we try and point people at someone else. We try and go, fine, hey, it was me. Yeah, I'm fine. It might be that this disc is broken. It's not my disc, it's, it's the disc, okay? Or it might be another T. So we need to learn to stop seeking blame. So, I have some improvement cutters for you. I told you there was lots of text. My improvement catters are little things that you can practice. So an improvement catter, you set yourself a goal. In this case, I want to improve my resilience. You take a little idea, you practice it, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, try something else. Okay? So uh, sticky notes down the side. Anybody that has ever worked with me will know that I don't go anywhere without sticky notes. Okay? Always have sticky notes. So my first tip is to go try and find a really painful failure that you've been through. Go and think back to how it felt. So when I think back to that who broke prod incident, these were my ideas of things that I would do next time. I stick them on a sticky note and I put them on my screen at work. Now those people that currently work with me will know I've got thousands of these sticky notes all over my desk. Now they know what they are. They're my ideas of how I want to respond next time something similar happens. My other tip is just to say thank you. If somebody gives you critical, uncomfortable feedback, just smile and nod, thank you for the feedback, and move on. And take your time to work out what actually your emotional reaction to it is. So just thank you for the feedback and move on. Now how are we going to stop ourselves from trying to seek out blame? You have to really consciously try. So go correct yourself. Every time you ask yourself, who broke prod? Or who is to blame for this? Rephrase it, either in your head or out loud. Rephrase it as, what are the factors that contributed to that failure? Okay? Don't be afraid to correct other people, even really senior people on this. The very first incident management review that I sat in, I instinctively corrected my COO when he started pointing the finger of blame. Um, and I felt really, really weird when everybody in the room looked at me and blushed, but it actually reset the whole conversation. So go rephrase the question as what are the factors that contributed? And the last one is really important. Remind yourself and rem remind your peers that it's okay to fail. We learn through failure. This is the one that senior managers tend to really, really struggle with. It is okay to fail. So... That human response to failure, though putting up the barriers, is most apparent, apparent during a major incident. We put up our boundaries and we're heads down trying to protect ourselves. Okay, we're trying to work through an issue, but you'll notice that during a major incident, people who don't feel safe sharing and people who are worried about blame tend to stop talking, they stop collaborating, and they stop sharing information which is really important to help you fix the issue. So this term, brutal transparency, actually comes from a little card. So I've got these flashcards that I keep on my desk. Go overshare. Be brutally transparent about what you're doing during an incident. On the back of this card, it says, the only way to build trust is to be honest and transparent under all circumstances. 
So during a major incident, be as honest as you can be about the state of the system. Go and share every single decision you've made and every single action you're taking and why. And don't be afraid about what your senior managers are thinking about the way that you're reacting to the issue. The next theme is about collaboration, and it's a big theme in the DevOps world. But when you're in the heat of the moment, you're kind of self-driven. And the times that I've seen issues raised most efficiently, fixed most efficiently, is when we've worked together. So if you have the luxury of being co-located with the other departments in your company, and you're fixing an issue, go sit with them. So that's my number one tip. Go work together, sit next to each other, talk through the problems together, and it helps you share the experience, and it helps you share the actions and the decisions you're making during a major incident. So, the improvement cutters for incident management. We saw a great example yesterday in Ewan's presentation where they set up a Slack channel, especially for an unknown incident. It helps you keep your timeline. It helps you record all your assumptions and your actions. It's great for when you go back to do the post-mortem, but it's also great for transparency. Don't do what one of my teams did and set up a separate Slack channel just for managers and then do your normal, everyday, real human being response to an incident and then the sanitised, expletive-free somewhere else. <laughs> so as a mid-level manager, I had the dubious uh, invitation to both of these Slack channels. One was really transparent and honest, full of swear words. It's fine. Your COO really doesn't care. Your CTO just wants you to help fix the issue. Yeah. So go share the honest account of what's going on. The next improvement cata is pair incident management. Now, I, I, don't know, I don't know whether this is a thing, but I've invented it. We use pair programming quite a lot. It's hard work. You sit next to each other. One person drives, the other person um, coaches, a bit like rally drivers. You've got a driver and a co-driver. I recommend doing this during an incident as well. So if you're responsible for external communications, do it with somebody else. Get a second pair of eyes. If you're diagnosing metrics or log files, do it with somebody else because you get to the, the point that you need to fix faster. And all the time you're sharing your ideas and sharing the actions you've taken. The important one is if you're about to go make a change to prod to fix an issue in the heat of the moment, <coughs> go get somebody else to help you review it. Okay. The last improvement category on incident management is the most important part of my talk today. If you take absolutely none of the others of these improvement categories, please, please, please take this one. The word we. Okay. After the Who Broke Prod incident, I decided that I was going to use the word we consciously. It's an incredibly hard habit to get into. I use we to mean me. I use we to mean my team, my peers, my department, my company. I use we to mean all of you. And just by using the word we, we build trust, and I've really noticed a difference. So when you use we, it shows that you care. When you use we, it brings people in, and it shows that we're all in this together. Okay? It sounds like such a small thing, but it is the thing which has driven the most change in my teams. Okay, blameless postmortems. So many people have come to speak to me about this, and you probably thought that was what this talk was going to be about, but it... It really isn't, okay? So I'm going to whiz through blameless payments mortems. There's lots of material out there about them, and maybe it's a great talk for open spaces later. The one thing I would say, though, is that post-mortem is the place where blame is most apparent. So it's a great place to start if you want to try eliminating the culture of blame. But if the only place that you're trying to tackle blame is after an incident, then you're not going to succeed. You need to bring it all the way forward, shift left, Bring it right to the beginning of the process and start tackling blame at the beginning, not at the end. If you want to find out more about blameless postmortems, there's a great book um, called Beyond Blame by Dave Zwieback. And in it, he suggests scrapping the word postmortem because it brings about images of death and murders and stuff. And instead, using the term learning review because that's what it is. It's not about finding a cause of death. It's about learning from our mistakes, learning from our assumptions and our actions, and improving next time. So, like I said, I'm going to whiz through it. My improvement categories are do blameless failures, 
and wherever possible, bring your senior management along for the ride. So if you've been in a, bla in a post mortem which you didn't feel was blameless and it left you feeling uncomfortable, then maybe go get a copy of the book and just discreetly leave it on somebody's desk. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back to how we prepare ourselves for failure. It's that preparation which means that we can respond effectively and we learn to deal with it. One of the best ways to do that is to make failure visible all of the time. Now, We've seen lots of tools outside about how you monitor your systems. Um, and it's reasonably traditional these days to have a screen with your SLA up for support or your availability, lots of shiny dashboards and widgets and stuff. Um, on our teams, in the dev teams, we have our CI pipeline up on screen so that people can see it. And by doing that, you're learning to make failure visible. So at Microgen, we've got these huge whiteboards and huge glass walls. We don't just visualize our system. We don't just put metrics on it. We visualize everything. So we visualize our Kanban board for a release, or we visualize process flows and value stream maps. But it doesn't stop there. It goes outside of the technology teams as well. So our sales guys have a visualization of their sales pipeline. So they're getting used to failing in front of us. If they miss their targets, everybody knows. If, the, um, if we get some critical feedback from clients, it goes on our feedback, our customer feedback wall. Um, and then, obviously, if we break the build, it's there on the screen and everybody can see it. So we're all getting used to failing publicly. And once that becomes normal, failure is less of something to worry about. And you'll find that those people who want to point the finger of blame don't bother again. If everybody's cool with failure, then why would you want to go and blame someone else? Okay. Um, in terms of metrics and what do you visualize, um, I was in a great open spaces yesterday where we were talking about visual, visualizing complex systems. And I talked a little bit about knowing what normal looks like. And the best way to prepare yourself for failure is to understand what the normal behavior of your system looks like or the normal flow of work through your team looks like. And that way you're better prepared to spot when it deviates from normal. So the improvement cutters for making failure visible. If you have not got an information radiator and you've seen all of the metrics monitoring tools out there, it's probably a little bit overwhelming. As a starting point, just go put your CI pipeline on a screen. It just takes one little monitor in the corner. Um, and then from there, see who talks about it. Put it somewhere really public. So perhaps in a kitchen or like a breakout area. And that way people from all over your business can see what's going on. So the guys in finance probably have not particular interest in what the individual metrics on a screen mean. But I guarantee to you, that if a screen which is normally green goes red, they notice. And sometimes they even come and offer to help. Okay. And in terms of knowing your normal, tools such as, such as AppDynamics and Instana, they'll show you uh, like a pretty picture of your system and help you understand the way that data goes through your system. And they'll help you understand what normal is and alert on what abnormal is. But you don't just need tools. You can start with a whiteboard. You can start with sticky notes. And that's a picture of my, one of my team members drawing out our AWS topology so that we can understand the way data flows through the system. Okay, I'm approaching the end of my talk. But this is the most important bit. Never, ever, ever punish somebody for trying. Okay? Punishment isn't just sacking somebody because they made a really, really big mistake. Punishment isn't just about restricting people's access to systems. Punishment can be in words. If you choose the wrong words, then people can feel at blame. And when people feel criticised, feel punished, it really, really restricts their creativity. So um, as a developer, I once joined a team um, who were halfway through a project and they had awful, awful UI performance problems. And I, I was massively frustrated. So I went in going, yeah, let's re-architect the whole thing. We'll change it. We'll put materialized views in. We can make all this bit asynchronous. And everybody was like, shh, don't say anything. Because last time anybody had tried to refactor the system, it had taken forever, it hadn't really achieved the goal, and they got some really, really bad feedback from their managers. And it was quite public. 
And the guy that had been instrumental in trying to make the change had then left, which is not much of a surprise, and he'd taken with him all of the domain knowledge around that area. And what it had taught the team was that if you try to make big changes and you don't succeed, then you get punished. And ever since then, nobody had tried anything innovative. Nobody had tried to go and make any good large technology changes because they knew that if it didn't work, they'd get in trouble. So instead of punishing people for trying stuff, do the opposite. Reward people for all the good stuff. So report people for just trying, reward people for experimenting with stuff, and really go and cement the fact that it's okay to fail. I've got some ideas of how you can do that. But as a group of change makers in the DevOps world, we are the people that can start making those changes to behavior. So you don't have to be a manager to be able to reward people. You don't have to have a budget for reward and recognition. You just have to use the right words. Wow, lots of words. OK, it's the last slide, so we're fine. Um, improvement cutters around rewarding people. This is hard, especially the Brits in the audience. We are not very good at gushing and giving love. We're just not very good at this. So you have to practice it. So at least twice a week, go and publicly sing someone's praises. It will feel uncomfortable to start with, and you'll feel bonkers, but go do it. Do it somewhere really, really public. So at Microgen, we have a, an HR tool where we offer shout-outs for people. So you can choose to be a little bit anonymous. It feels a bit distant. People seem more, much more comfortable doing that than just standing up in a room and going, hooray! But go reward and reinforce the positive behaviours around experimenting with new ideas. Go reward people that have collaborated across teams and anybody that's helped in the heat of the moment. While we don't want to reward a hero culture, any collaboration, any shared accountability should be rewarded. And in a learning review, not a post-mortem, or a sprint retrospective that's been really, really tough, go and celebrate it afterwards. Yeah? So if you've looked back on a horrible, pain, painful failure as a team, and you've had a really uncomfortable post-mortem, if you've been honest and accountable, go celebrate it afterwards. Go out for lunch. Not only is it a great bonding experience, but it sort of diffuses that uncomfortable situation that you've been in. And in terms of rewarding, go use the terms thank you and well done. So even if you're sat in a post-mortem, where you, in your head you think, oh my God, that was a complete disaster, say thank you to anybody that tried. Anybody that shared their honest account in a learning review, just say thank you. And you go reward contribution to an honest post-mortem. So laptop stickers, they get everybody excited. Little laptop sticker, you can get them in less than 48 hours notice. A little gift to say thank you for coming along and giving your account. Or if you really want to reward someone, you could go get a ticket for a conference. <laughs> okay. I really do mean it when I say that change starts with the people in this room. So if you change your own behaviours to demonstrate the, the behaviour that you expect of others, and if you start consciously changing your own approach to failure and your own words around blame, then people start noticing. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>